Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation, our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, for those in-house, we do appreciate your checking one last time as a courtesy that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage following today's presentation for everyone's future reference as well. Opening our discussion today is David Burton, who serves as Senior Fellow in Economic Policy in our Institute of Economic Freedom and Opportunity. Prior to joining us here at Heritage, he served as General Counsel at the National Small Business Administration, as Chief Financial Officer and General Counsel for the Alliance for Retirement Prosperity, and was a partner in the Argus Group, a public policy and government relations firm. He has also held positions in the areas of finance and tax. Please join me in welcoming David Burton. David. Hello, and thanks for coming to what I believe will be a very high quality, informative uh, event. I'm going to introduce uh, our two participants in this event and then say a few words and, and turn it over because I don't think you're here to listen to me. Paul Winfrey. Uh, is going to interview Dr. McCluskey, uh, and uh, let me introduce Paul and Dr. McCluskey. Uh, Paul is the director of the Rowe Institute here at the Heritage Foundation and also the director of uh, the Center for Data Analysis. He previously served on the Senate Budget Committee as a staffer handling health care, uh, private health insurance, income security programs, uh, uh, and a, a wide variety of different uh, 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 income maintenance type programs. And before that, he uh, worked at the CDA here at Heritage. He has a master's degree in economics and economic uh, history from the London School of Economics. He's a PhD candidate there and has an undergraduate degree from George Mason University in economics. Dr. Deirdre McCluskey is a uh, uh, one of our foremost economists and economic historians. Uh, she uh, taught 12 years at the University of Chicago, where I had the good fortune of studying price theory from Dr. McCluskey. She also has served as the chairman of the economics department at the University of Iowa. Uh, and for, I guess, about 15 years, uh, was a professor of economics, history, English, and communications at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and is now emeritus at the uh, U of I. She has a bachelor's and PhD in economics from Harvard, uh, which I try not to hold against you. So. I hold it against <laughs> uh, She is the author of 16 books, uh, which is a lot of books and hundreds, literally, of, of academic articles. But I wanted to bring to your attention, uh, I guess, six of those books. You're going to hear a lot, I think, of the, uh, I th what I think could fairly be described as a magisterial trilogy called Bourgeois Equality, Bourgeois Dignity, and Bourgeois Virtues. Uh, those three books are unusual in a number of respects. One, the breadth and erudition with which they're written, uh, the interdisciplinary nature, drawing on economics, economic history, uh, political and social history, ethics, um, and a wide variety of other disciplines. They also are unusual, at least in economics, in that they're extremely well written. They're a genuine pleasure to read. Uh, and and I, I really, I have read the first two, not the third. And, and they, uh, they're they genuinely worth reading. But Dr. McCluskey has done uh, a number of other, written a number of other books that I think really are worth engaging with. And before I forget, let me say that if you want to go find the books or the articles, you can go to her website, www.deirdremccluskey.com. And a lot, of, a lot of this material is uh, available in PDF form. And of course, the books you generally have to buy 
unfortunately. But I will say this. I'll, 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 back, I'll go back. The Applied Theory of Price, uh, which is a, a textbook on, on price theory that we used at Chicago in mimeo form. We were your guinea pigs. And uh, the, the uh, Applied Theory of Price is available in its entirety in a PDF format. And Dr. McCluskey informed me that uh, she's thinking of... Uh, doing a reworked version of that in the near future, which would be a good thing, because I believe, anyway, based that uh, the core of truth in economics is, is in price theory. But she's also written on a wide variety of other subjects, uh, methodology, epistemology, rhetoric in the classical sense of the art of persuasion, um, the philosophy of science, or really social science, ethics, political theory, the use and misuse of statistics and economics, uh, law and economics, economic history, especially British history, and uh, social and political history. And the, the three other books I just wanted to bring to your attention that, uh, that you might want to, to look up, The Rhetoric of Economics, which deals with uh, how economics can persuade, but also what sort of the proper way of of addressing economic subjects. The Secret Sense of Economics, which is available in a PDF form and uh, well worth reading, sort of addresses, in I think very accessible way, methodological issues. Or, and uh, then also Knowledge and Persuasion Economics. The corpus of her work makes her, in my judgment, one of the most worthwhile economists who are currently living to engage with. There, there's a lot to learn there on a lot of different subjects. And I would really recommend everyone in this room, everyone watching on the internet, to engage with Dr. McCluskey's work because it brings a genuine reward. So with that, I will hand it over to Paul. And, and, uh, and I think you're in for a treat. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David. You didn't mention me as one of the economists who's uh, <laughs> worth reading. Um, I, I won't hold that against you. But, uh, th thanks for that strong, uh, uh, strong introduction. Uh, most modern economists fall into two camps. Those that make small but statistically significant additions to economic science and those that make the same intellectual mistakes of their forebears. <laughs> However, uh, Professor McCloskey does not fit into either one of those camps. Her career has been truly remarkable. Not just statistically significant, but incredibly meaningful to anyone interested in ethics, language, economic history, sociology, the history of economic thought, and a branch of economics that she has essentially defined, humanomics. I first encountered Deidre's work on Adam Smith and virtue ethics as an undergraduate at George Mason. In graduate school, and you probably for, forgotten about this work, but I was exp exposed extensively to your work on 19th century Irish productivity that set the benchmark for the practice of professional climatricians for at least two generations. Over the last 40 years, Deidre has published, I believe it's 17 books, uh, correction to David Burton's uh, introduction, and nearly 400 scholarly articles on a wide range of topics. The rabbi, Abraham Heschel, has said that a, world, a word creates new worlds. And we're here today to first talk about the importance of language and attitudes in uh, determining economic betterment, but we'll probably uh, have a conversation about some other topics as well. So first of all, uh, Professor McCloskey, can you please explain to us how the world got rich? Well, from, I think, from a, a change in ideology a change in ethical attitudes towards entrepreneurs, merchants, manufacturers. In, in almost all earlier societies, uh, earlier than England in the 19th century, the, the middle class, the the bourgeoisie was held in contempt. 
those that mattered were the the aristocracy and their um, their agents, or the or the or the priesthood and their agents. You 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 can see this, for example, in 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 Shakespeare, who himself was middle class, but in all his plays, the heroes are aristocrats, and even in the Merchant of of Merchant of Venice, the merchant of the title is Antonio, uh, is a fool for love. Um, and 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 um, Shylock is hardly an honored middle class figure. By the early 19th century, in even so non bourgeois character as um, Jane Austen, there's a kind of amiable. Uh, Admiration wouldn't be quite the word, but amiable t t toleration of trade <clears throat> and, 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 and banking and so forth. So I, I think that's the key, this ideological change. It wasn't an increase in investment. It wasn't overseas trade. It wasn't even changes in institutions, as my friend, the late... Doug North claimed without very much evidence. <laughs> uh, it, it was in the realm of ideas, the same ideas that most of you in this room are, are concerned with. That's what made the modern world. And the evidence for it is, I think, overwhelming. It's in these three books. But to, to, to take a, two recent examples, China and India, 40% of the world's population, uh, abandoned in 1978 and in 1991, socialism, and have achieved astonishing economic growth as a result of this ideological change. That's interesting. It, you, you mentioned China and India just there. You, you, you just visited Chile, if, I, if I'm I I was there, but then shortly afterwards, I was in, in China. I was doing all the countries that begin with CH. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything interesting that you, you saw happening in Chile? Or? In Chile, it's already happened. Uh -huh. I talk more of the Chicago boys than Milton Friedman did. Milton, <laughs> and Milton Friedman had virtually nothing to do with the... Uh, the uh, regime. He spent an hour with the, the general urging him to control high powered, the high powered supply of money. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it happened, and now Chile is a quite successful free market mm -hmm. um, country. My, my friends there are the ones who would be the first to claim this. It's not that it hasn't got any problems, but it's it's moved into high income mm -hmm. and is going to is going to st um, st stay there as long as it doesn't experiment mm -hmm. with uh, socialism. Mm -hmm. But the but what was just amazing to me was mm -hmm. the three the three weeks I spent after that visit to Chile and China. And I think if we got our socialist friends, and I have a great m many socialist friends, I was once a Marxist myself, if, if, if we got them to go to China, help, um, and um, uh, we, we, in fact, it would be an excellent um, pro project of the Heritage Institution to select the most so socialist inclined members of Congress and send them to China for three weeks. I think they're hopeless. No, no, no. You, you just say, look at Shanghai, guys and gals, and see what you see. Yeah. And what, what you see 
is an astonishing um, good outcome of free enterprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there is, as my socialist friends always say, ah oh, yes, there's got to be a role for government. Don't you think there should be a role for, for government? And I say, well, yeah, okay, there's a role for, for government. But in, in China after 1978, the Communist Party stopped doing amazingly stupid things. And it started trying to do its job as a, mm -hmm. as a government to provide a, a water supply, although that can be privatized. Supply electricity, although that can be really privatized, and suddenly, and then allowing people to build mm -hmm. and to open small shops, and it's just astonishing what happened. Mm -hmm. A a c colleague of mine at Fudan University said that when he came to the university as a student in 1981, in Shanghai there were two tall building, say, above 30 stories. Now there are 2,000. There are many more tall buildings than in Manhattan. It's incredible. It's, it's really, uh, I had to explain to my uh, Chinese hosts the meaning of the American word rube, because I felt like a rube, <laughs> a, a, a country person who comes to the big city and says, wow. Everything's up to date in Kansas City. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I was just amazed. So you're very optimistic, it sounds, um, with China and India. Yeah, I am. And how optimistic are you about the trajectory of the United States and policymaking in the U.S.? Well, we're kind of a compromise between um, in, uh, China and India on the one hand, it sounds very strange, and, and Europe on the other, we're kind of in between. And it could go either way. Um, I, I was appalled by the results of the election. Um, but it's an ill wind that blows no good. And what we might get is significant de deregulation. I, 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 uh, regulation is just slow socialism. And in Europe, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What, I, I think which, what probably um, uh, inclined the ordinary voter in Britain to vote against staying in the common market was some years ago, some many years ago, the common market folks um, said uh, <laughs> Cadbury's is not to be called chocolate. Cadbury's, <coughs> the largest selling ca candy bars in um, in, in England and in Britain, because it doesn't have enough cocoa in it. It's too got too much sugar and miscellaneous fats and so on. And this just outraged mm -hmm. the, the British. Cadbury's, Cadbury's is our, uh, you know, is our our chocolate. Yeah, yeah. So no, I I um, uh, I think slow socialism might be turned around in the incoming, uh, I hesitate to say, I hate to say it, Trump administration. Mm -hmm. So let, let, let me look back um, for a moment and talking a little bit more about language and the importance of words. So language was incredibly important to both Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. They were, um, both of them, especially Smith, but also Mill. That's right. So Smith, so Smith for Smith, language was important to to trade yeah. and persuading yeah. um, one's uh, 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 fellow brothers that uh, trade would uh, would improve both of their lives. Well, he 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 went further. Actually, mm -hmm. he said that trade and language are the same thing. Mm -hmm. He said the offer of a sh the offer of a sh of a shilling, which seems to us so transparent and obvious, a uh, act is is an act of persuasion. Mm -hmm. Sweet talk, as I call it. <laughs> and it is. It is. The very word persuasion has the Indo-European root that comes out in, in, in our word sweet, uh, Latin um, uh, suadio, mm -hmm. 
and language is largely cooperative, in fact, immensely mm -hmm. cooperative, just as trade is. Mm -hmm. And he emphasized this. He didn't, he didn't push it very far, mm -hmm. but he, he, in various places he says it. Mm -hmm. And then John Stuart Mill, as a, as a philosopher, would naturally mm -hmm. think of language as being central. He's not as, as good as Smith is. By the way, his first job was um, uh, teaching English composition mm -hmm. to Scottish boys. Um, f f um, fourteen year olds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, language, how we talk matters. Mm -hmm. It's not just, uh, look, be, between 1890 and 1980, all of us were Marxists, more or less. We all thought that all that mattered were material conditions. Yeah. And that ideas, oh well, that's just foolishness. What matters is your um, your your position in the means of production. Sure. Yeah, that's right. So, so for for Smith, if if language is important to trade, and for Mill, I think language is important to um, not just trade, but but also concepts of self government and that's discussion. That's true. Free and speech debate, is famous free speech. Speech and free speech. Yeah. Um, why? Do you think, um, and you, you, you just sort of referenced this, that we were all Marxists once, and maybe we still are all Marxists. Not all uh, <laughs> Maybe not us, but you know, maybe they're all Marxists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, why do you think that the economics profession has generally lost its interest in language, and, um, and, and, and what can we do to uh, maybe bring that interest back? Well, but, there... there there's a problem that language is the subject of the humanities. And economists fiercely define themselves as against the humanities, what we call, we, in, in uh, American English, the humanities, English and uh, philosophy and, and history and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we're, we economists are so obsessed with being scientists in the peculiar English sense of science. Anyone here who's familiar with any other language, modern language, knows that the word science in that other language, as in English before the middle of the 19th century, means merely systematic inquiry. So you can have in German, uh, klassische Wissenschaft, what? Classical science, or a still more strange word in, in uh, German, the word for the for the, the humanities in German is 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 is, is, is Geisteswissenschaft, spirit sciences. Wee wee, scary music. <laughs> um, it, and it it it's it's a terrible problem in modern economics, this split between the humanities and the sciences. And in fact, I've concluded, I've come to the conclusion that in every science, there has to be a categorizing humanistic step. Mm -hmm. Because what the humanities are most centrally about, mm -hmm. as sciences now insist, mm -hmm. as in Italian or in Turkish or, or any other language, sciences, systematic inquiries, is appropriate categories. Consumption, investment, right? Market, firm. And thinking carefully about those categories, before you count, is the um, humanistic part mm -hmm. of economic science. Then you count. Then you start, then you ask how big is big. And that's the that's the quantitative mm -hmm. science part of the science of economics. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's just crazy that economists, well, I, my, my joke is that um, my economics colleagues hate it that I mention the humanities, novels and poetry and so on. Um, and and I I'm, I'm a, was a, a professor of English. And my friends, colleagues in the English and History Department hate it that I'm an economist, yeah. mm -hmm. which means I don't have any friends. <laughs> <laughs>
it's, I, by the way, I also make the same joke. You know, you can always use these jokes in another way. I, I say, say, I, 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 I say to the right, Marx was the greatest social scientist of the 19th century without compare. And I, I really think that's uncontroversial. He was a great intellect, uh, an amazing guy, uh, very broad. Okay, so that all my uh, friends on the right get angry at me. And then I say, but he got everything wrong. <laughs> and the friends on the left who were hopeful when I said the first thing get mad at me and then I don't have any friends. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I think Samuelson said something like Marx lacked creativity. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if he lacked creativity. That's an odd thing to say. Well, Paul, by the way, was my mother's longtime mixed doubles tennis partner. Oh, wow. <laughs> just, just in case you care. <laughs> so you mentioned... Um, uh, uh, having taught many of the Chicago boys who obviously had a tr have had a tremendous amount of influence on public policy, uh, yeah. both in the U.S. and abroad. Yeah. Um, uh, where have uh, economic experts, wh whether or not they're professors at the University of Chicago, Harvard, MIT, or elsewhere, or in think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, um, led policymakers astray, and where have they led policymakers um, in the right direction over the last well, 50 it, years? Well, in the right direction, all economists, all modern economists, are quantitative. Even the Austrians have become quantitative. They're all asking, how big is big? And that's always a sensible thing to ask. Uh, so that's good. Where I uh, once wrote wrote an article, Accounting, the Master me Metaphor of Economics, or is making the point that accounting categories, if you don't get the accounting categories right, mm -hmm. you, you're going to do the economic analysis wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's good. They're, they're, let's get the accounting right, and then let's measure it. But what, alas, what many modern economists don't get is any kind of education in real uh, uh, price theory. I don't mean microeconomics and Moscow and uh, type where you learn all about constraint maximization. I mean understanding entry and exit, understanding the idea of equilibrium, meaning no excess profits. I mean understanding that the government is not composed invariably of wise and swell guys who will do everything perfectly. I, I caught Joe, um, um, I caught Joe Stiglitz, caught him as, well, I don't know, I don't think he would, I don't know, anyway, I, I, I caught him saying in an interview, if, if there's an externality, then the government should step in, period. Now, if I wear an ugly orange dress, hideous, you know, 1970s burnt orange, um, and uh, everyone who looks at me is offended and, and irritated, that's an externality. Mm -hmm. So according to Joe, then, I guess, we should have an, a dress agency <laughs> to, to compensate for this terrible externality of, of Deirdre going around in an orange dress. I mean, it's it's... Pazzo, it's insane, local, mm -hmm. to think this way and to think that there, there's this costless transfers and costless, <laughs> costless everything in the government and costly stupid mistakes in the market, uh, whereas the evidence is actually the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't, uh, basically what Stiglitz is speaking to is in part this, uh, this, uh, this trade-off between liberty and Proto optimality yeah. that Sen has has talked about, yeah. writ, written on in the '60s and '70s, um, and uh, and I, I you know I I think that that's a, that there's an interesting point there that, that that you make that in in some ways economists can become obsessed with the um, the optimal condition yeah, and right. the model that they've constructed. Well, but that, that's the point. If all you know about the economy or at least price theory, or at least microeconomics, 
is what, what I call Max U. In German, it would be Max U. His first name is Max. His second name is U. He's a, I don't know, v Vietnamese Jew or something. I don't know what his <laughs> ethnicity is. But he, he's, he's, if, if that's all you know about human behavior, then, as you said, you're always trying to maximize. I once had a, had a nightmare, um, a neoclassical economist nightmare, uh, it, or a, a much better word, by the way, it's not neoclassical, but, but uh, I'm saying Masonian, because modern economics is, was completely reformed by Paul Samuelson and Kenneth Arrow, his um, brother-in-law. It's worth knowing that Larry Summers has an uncle named Paul Samuelson and another uncle named Ken, um, Kenneth Arrow. And here's what the nightmare was. I'm not much subject to nightmares, so this was unusual. I imagined that I was going to make every decision perfectly, optimally. So, I'm going to reach for the bottle of water. Am I doing it in just the right way? I don't know. Oh, geez. If I don't do it in exactly the right way, I'll fail in my attempt to bring water to my mouth. And you can see that if you actually thought that that was the central task of being a human being, you'd go nuts. <laughs> because, because we make mistakes all the time. Everyone in this room, I take it, realizes that we, we stumble through life as in a fog. And the question is, does a market-oriented way of, of the stumbling come closer or does it drive us away from the roughly right way of doing things. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a ma matter again of magnitude, mm -hmm. of how big is big. I I just did a paper where I where I listed all the imperfections that economists have declared the market has since um, since 1848 when they, they they had finally gotten straight what markets are doing, yeah. and it's astounding astounding. I came up with 105. I'm going to ask Dave, uh, uh, Dave here to come up with 50 more. Um, and and if, you, if, you, if you take that attitude towards market economies, you're going to find imperfections by the, by, the, by, the, by the boatload. And you're going to end up, as many economists do, not really believing in markets, as we say. And they'll scorn the very idea of believing in markets. But all markets are is mutually advantageous deals among free people. What's the beef? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, um, uh, your list reminds me of another list that I pick up every couple of months um, uh, and, and work a little on trying to document all of the different times when Experts have claimed that the robots will take over our jobs. Yeah, I'm, that's right. I'm, I'm trying to go all the way back to the cavemen. Good you know, for you. The, <laughs> Good for you. The fire will take our jobs. Yeah, I make this. Uh, I, 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 I make this point. In, I make this point in the third volume. That's exactly right. Ro robot sounds really scary, mm -hmm. um, but it's just a tool. It's just a tool. Yeah. There, there's a when when Milton Friedman went to China in 1988. He was shown a construction site, and he noticed that, that the men had sho shovels, but there was no steam shovels in sight, no earth-moving equipment. He said to the Communist Party official, you know, what, what's going on here? Why don't you have a, a steam shovel to speed up the job? Man, and, the, and the official said proudly, but, but if they use shovels, they all have jobs. And Milton said, oh, okay, well, then I have a proposal. Take away their shovels and give them spoons, <laughs> and they'll have even more jobs. <laughs> uh, um, uh, in the last administration, there was a, um, a gentleman um, who I believe is in Chicago um, named Kay Sunstein, who wrote a book. Yes, he's, he, he's yeah. a lawyer, um, which with, explains it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who wrote a book with a uh, with an economist who's at the University of Chicago mm -hmm. on um, 
on nudging. Nudging, yeah. Um, and you just spoke to Max. You could you tell you know say a few words on the concept of nudging towards optimal behavior and yeah. how you feel about that? Well, the idea is that I'm from the government and I'm here to help you, <laughs> and I want to, you to make the correct decision about your pension mm -hmm. or uh, whatever. And so we're, we're going to make the form that we that we give to you um, have the have have a structure that's going to guide you, nudge you towards the optimal dis decision. You're going to start saving earlier in your life, and you're going to you're you're, you're going to believe me, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be much better off. Yeah. And I, I um, my friend. B Bob Frank at, at, or at Cornell is part of this gang, and, and Bob says to me, look, it's, it's just paternalistic libertarianism. <laughs> and I say, Robert, give me a break. <laughs> Are we dealing with adults or children? With children, you got a nudge. Anyone here as a parent knows about, 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 about nudging. But it's, it's essential to a free society that we treat adults as adults. And if, if, they're, if they want to consume recreational drugs, we should, we should let them, in my opinion. And uh, if we, it, the, the problem with, with, with nudging, as far as I can see, is that there, there is no stopping point. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to lose weight. Um, um, well, OK, let's get a government agency to nudge me um, in various ways, um, it's quite striking that people in New York, in the administration in New York, think in New York City, think that imposing uh, taxes on sugar drinks will help cure obesity by cutting down the number, of just going up the demand curve. Yet they don't believe that imposing a minimum wage has any effect on the demand for labor. It's quite an interesting <laughs> contrast. <laughs> I actually heard someone defending this, and he said, oh, well, but labor and soft drinks are not the, they're not the same. <laughs> well, let's see, they're priced, they're, you know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But should, should, should policymakers, um, you, you, you talked about the, um, Treating people like adults, yes. and I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, but, but uh, one of the other problems that the, the the nudgers have is is an information problem. Yeah, you're telling me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? They, yes. they, you know, first of all, it's difficult to to know what is what is an optimal outcome to begin That's right. with. That's right. Um, and so what it, it seems to me like they end up doing is, is that they end up essentially defining what, what they think the parameters should look sure, like. Sure, of course. Um, and then ultimately nudging people towards a... It's highly authoritarian. Yes. Yeah. Um, they, the way that alcohol has been, has mm -hmm. been treated in the, in, the, in the northern parts of Europe and the United States is, is a good example. Um, there was uh, uh, prohibition in, 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 in pr prohibition from 1919 to 1932 in Finland, yeah. almost the same dates as in the United States, and it's the same. Oh, you can't control it, and it turned out that it turns out that actually Finns do not consume excessive amounts of alcohol over the year. It's just that they do have a habit of drinking it very quickly. <laughs> and this is a problem. But, but, you know, we got lots of problems. I don't know French. I should know French. It's outrageous. It's idiotic that a person who considers himself a scholar doesn't, can't read French very well. You have a French um, word in the title of your books. I know. I use bourgeois. It's a great word. Bourgeoise, by the way, is the, is, is the female. Um, but... What? That there should be uh, nudging to get me into French? Uh, it, we, we, either we're a free people or we're not. Mm -hmm. And we've got to stop thinking, well, I'm, I'm okay with my freedom, but I'd like these other people to stop doing what they're doing. And that is a deep American 
Mm -hmm. Traditionally, the, um, the, the great John Hughes, an economic historian at Northwestern, made this point. He said that from the beginning, from New England and Virginia, at the beginning of our country, there was this two-sided, yes, we're free, but by the way, you're a slave. <laughs> yes, we're free, but by the way, we want to intervene in your, in your sex life. Mm -hmm. There's a constant tension in the United States between these two. Mm -hmm. That's right. Live free or die was the license motto. In New Hampshire, it still is. Mm -hmm. and a long time ago, a guy put a piece of masking tape over the live free or die part. He mm -hmm. didn't want to go around on his license plate saying live free or die. And you know what happened to him? He was arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great, it's true, it actually happened. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a two and a half year old and I think that anybody who has a two and a half year old uh, gets that humans want to be free. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, but, but, and some humans, namely two and a half year olds, yeah. need to be nudged. That's true. Or, 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 sure. or, or picked up bodily and moved. Yeah. <laughs> Could be an interesting room. social experiment if we don't. But, yeah, you know, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that, that we can all agree that we just finished a, a very long presidential race. Yes, two years. <laughs> in, in which socialism, Marxism, statism uh, have all reared their ugly heads. They have. Uh, tell us why you think, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the introduction of media, which has provided, I, I believe, a, a, a great deal of exposure to what socialism and communism actually look like, do we still witness these ideas creeping up? And how well, even in Eastern back? Europe, yeah, even in Eastern Europe, it's quite shocking. I think it's just a, a vintage effect. Those who actually grew up under central planning sure. socialism, people my age, mm -hmm. in Poland, mm -hmm. uh, know perfectly well that it's crazy to have only green raincoats yeah. and yeah. Uh, not have enough toilet paper yeah. and things like that. I was in Poland in, in the August. 1988, just before the government agreed to speak to Solidarity, and I literally saw on the horizon, it was like some vision, a man with a broomstick with rolls of toilet paper on it that he was carrying back to his house. He had obviously found toilet paper at the controlled price and bought up all he could. <laughs> but young people don't know it. And here, here's a problem with young people. I was once young, so I understand this. They come from families, from, I, most people, I'm fairly confident to say, from, from loving families. Mm -hmm. Now notice, loving families are socialist enterprises. From each according to his need, to, to each according to his need, from each according to his ability. Um, income appears from God knows where, maybe from daddy. And mom is the social pl is the central planner, and that, <laughs> she is, and it's entirely appropriate and a good thing. I'm not against families. I've had one myself. I was married for three years. Okay, that um, that's a good thing. But then, if you don't grow up on a farm, or are not as a kid actively involved in a small enterprise of some sort, you don't realize how market forces impinge on this family. Sure. It's all free lunches. Sure. Just comes and goes. And, and when you realize that there are, are if you're a middle class kid like I was, my father was a professor too, um, it, you, when you realize there are poor people, you think, well, what's the obvious solution? Open daddy's wallet. Why, what would be, a, I mean, that's where everything else comes from, so open daddy's wallet. So redistribution, um, uh, planning, we all plan our lives. Of course, anyone with any sense knows that you can't, but, and I'm, I'm in a very good position to talk about that. Um, but but um, we try to plan, of course we do. You plan your day, you plan your year, you plan your whatever. And your and your um, so planning socialism, the the visible hand has this tremendous emotional 
attraction. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't work for what Hayek called the great society in advance of, uh, of, of Johnson is, um, in fact, in the op more or less the opposite me me meaning of Johnson's great society, mm -hmm. is, not, is something that's very hard to get people to believe. So, um, it's our job. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you talk about in the books is that ideas and language and persuasion and all of these things have all led to a, a, a massive explosion in economic betterment over the last right. 200 to 250 years. That's right. Um, how has uh, that... Uh, massive explosion in economic betterment led to changes in thinking on economics and how the economy works. Well, unfortunately, it's had a perverse effect. Mm -hmm. And it, it's quite strange, actually. If, if, if people just looked around it with any insight, they'd see that it's liberty, what, what Adam Smith, I always cross myself, <laughs> Adam Smith said, um, he called it the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. That was his very phrase. Now, you, you may be surprised by the equality part, but he doesn't mean French-style post-earning equality. He meant the equality of social... And, and social standing, that he was very um, uh, warm about. He, Adam Smith, as my friends on the left are always saying, is an egalitarian. But they want to make him a kind of Rousseau-type egalitarian. Mm -hmm. He's not. He's an Adam Smith egalitarian. And then the, the second one, equality, liberty, and justice, is, the f is his freedom of enterprise. The freedom to use your labor wherever you want, which, which he's insistent on. He gets very hot at regulations of, of the labor market that prevent poor people from um, going and working where they want to. And then justice means equal justice before the law. So that's the... Um, that, that's what made us rich, is my claim. And, I, you know, I've got a fair amount of evidence for it, 1,700 pages, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, all kinds of evidence, quantitative, uh, categorical, this humanistic sort of evidence, all kinds of things. Yet, when we got rich, and here, and it's really crucial to know how much richer we were than, are than we were. It, it, you have to understand this. It's not... 100% richer or 200% richer per capita, it's conservatively measured 3,000% richer. If you take, uh, if, you, if, you, if you go see um, the, the Plymouth Plantation reenactment in southeastern Massachusetts, which I advise you do if you're down that way, um, you see how very, very poor the first and first generation of migrants to the to Massachusetts were um, and, and and then you, you if you start adding it up and start thinking of electricity and warm warm or cool rooms and inexpensive steel and education for everybody and blah 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 you can you can feature this three thousand percent and if 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 you keep that in mind it's very hard to argue against liberalism now <laughs> Our dear friends on the left argue against it by saying the government did it. This uh, character Matsukato, you know her book on uh, the entrepreneurial state, I think she calls it. Mm -hmm. She says that all innovations come from the government. Mm -hmm. This this is crazy. It it it's. We had a vice president who invented the internet. Yeah, he invented and, the internet, yeah. and they all, it's always the government. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I call it the supply chain fallacy. Yeah. If anywhere in the supply chain there's some thing the government does, then the whole supply chain is attributable to the government. And that's an anti-economic way of thinking. Economics 
among other things, is about substitutes. And it turns out that one of her favorite examples is the guy who invented the uh, touch screen. You know, a touch screen. Turns out that her proof that it was a government triumph, uh, a triumph for industrial planning, which she admires so much, I hear this, is that this kid who invented it had an NSF grant. <laughs> That's it. He didn't even have a research grant, I don't think. I think it was his PhD grant. <laughs> it was the National Science Foundation grant. That's it. That's, that's the evidence. So that's the supply chain fallacy. Yeah. Which more than anything shows the extent to which the government is involved in subsidizing various things in society. Yeah, but, but it, it doesn't mean that, there, that right. without the government you that's wouldn't right. have had whatever you're talking about, or maybe even, that's right. even better. We, in the old days we called it the Tang fallacy. Right. The Tang fallacy is from the, the, the spin-offs from the space program. Yeah. The numerous spin-offs. Yeah. Your life has been made so much better. Um, and <laughs> one of the spin-offs was this horrible orange powdered orange drink called Tang. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have one last question before we wrap up today. We've both sure. written that um, we should be optimistic about the future. Yeah. Why do you think that we should we should uh, look at the future with I think the demonstration effect of liberal policies, rather contrary to what I was saying a few minutes ago about the attractiveness mm -hmm. of um, socialist thinking, is very powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I wish that a country I know and love, South Africa, would look across the Indian Ocean to India and see for itself that if you lay off, you, if you start acting like the Indian government began to act in 1991, you get growth rates of 5 or 8 percent a year, whereas South Africa is and, and Brazil, another country I love, is stumbling along at 2 percent per year, if that, mm -hmm. per capita. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the success of China and India, 40% of the world's population, will show it. Although, you know, the trouble is we've had so many examples. David and I were talking about this before. If you, if you were to draw up a chart of liberalism, as I want to call it, and, and statism, and success and failure, <laughs> the liberalism success quadrant would be filled with uh, Hong Kong and Singapore and I mean in the economic sense those are uh, certainly Singapore is a tyranny in politics but uh, uh, China and India and then going earlier Britain the United States France um, Europe in general, it's brief, uh, the excellent example of this is Sweden, which in the middle of the 19th century had its kind of um, liberal uh, explosion, and then which continued actually for a, a century afterwards and then grew very fast. And the other quadrant, the, the, fail, uh, the failed statist quadrant, would be filled with re a remarkable variety of abject failures denied by my friends on the left who say, ah, Andrew Jackson, internal improvements, the United States has always been statist, and look where it's got us. Um, and I, it, it just wears me out that they won't pay attention to Venezuela or Argentina. Argentina is a wonderful case because in the 1890s, it was one of one of the richest countries in the world, number three or four, and now it's way down in the tables. And in Argentina, the idea is that I tax you to subsidize him, I tax him to subsidize her, I tax her to subsidize you. So we're all, everyone's got <laughs> subsidies. It's wonderful. Everyone is protected. It's wonderful. And you do that, you go down the down the growth tables. Yeah. This has been really wonderful. 
Um, I encourage everyone to go to DeidreMcClowski.com and go see all it's of It's not dot .com, it's dot .org, which, dot is, org. which is interesting in itself. When <laughs> I proposed to the, my, my university that they, that they go on paying for this for a while, <laughs> they said, well, if you're going to do that, we can't call it com. And I said, why not? Because we're a, we're, a, we're a state institution, and we can't do anything with com in it. We're org. <laughs> <laughs> dot org. <laughs> uh, you can get the books, and you can also see all of your work there, which you is uh, e extremely um, uh, fascinating. Uh, and so please thank me, or join me in thanking you. Thank you. <laughs>